my name is Matthias. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about regex and regex in PowerShell. Um, I first want to talk a little bit about myself. Um, I work in info security on the defensive side, and that's an inherently stressful field. So when I come home in the afternoon and the evening, I want to do something to relax. And what I do is I try to seek out problems that people have with PowerShell. It sounds like a bit of a weird hobby. Um, <laughs> But it's very interesting. Uh, exposing yourself to other people's problem gives you a broader view of what you can do to solve any kind of problem you might you know, find in the future. Um, when I come to this kind of conference, I have a bit of a weird experience because people hear my name and they come up and they say, oh, thanks for helping me out. And I say, well, I've, I've never met you. How can I have helped you out? But one of my biggest fetishes is answering questions on Stack Overflow. And Apparently, people like to ask questions and get help. Um, so that's great, two ways. Uh, one day in July um, last year, I came home and was about to do some Stack Overflow scavenging, finding some interesting PowerShell questions, and Stack Overflow was down. This happens once in a while, but it was down for like half an hour. At the end of the day, the Stack, uh, Stack Exchange Network status block posted this message. Outage post-mortem. On July 20th, we experienced a 34-minute outage. It took 10 minutes to identify the cause, 14 minutes to write the code to fix it, and another 10 minutes to roll out the code to fix it. The direct cause was a malformed post that caused one of our regular expressions to consume high CPU on our web servers. Now, what does that mean? Apparently, at, at, uh, at Stack Overflow, when you go to the website, they show you a long list of the newest asked questions with a summary of the question that, that was asked. And they're using regular expressions to trim that message down and give you just like a substring of what is, what is in there. What they hadn't expected was that someone would post some code that would completely mess up this regular expression engine and cause their entire infrastructure to overload. That happens. We're going to get back to that. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the origin of regular expressions. Everybody likes a history lesson. We're going to talk about support for regex and PowerShell, which is kind of the .NET flavor, the .NET regex engine. Uh, and then we're simply going to dive into some examples uh, of how people can and have applied regex to solve real world problems. Because I, I find that way more interesting than me just yapping on for an hour, and I, I hope you will. And then at the end, maybe we'll talk a little bit about trade-offs. Um, there's not a silver bullet solution to anything. So uh, regular expressions was conceived by a linguist or a language theorist called Stephen Kleen in 1956 when he conceived this concept of a regular language. Uh, a regular language is not the language we speak, the natural language that we use to communicate, but a very simple type of language. I'm not a language theorist and I won't go into what a regular language is, but the idea is that a regular expression can, can be used to describe patterns in a regular language. So when Ken, Ken Thompson was working on the ED editor in Unix, he needed some sort of way to search through a large document succinctly and kind of find a single line. He needed a piece of information. And so he implemented something called grep. Uh, it stands for something like global search uh, uh, replace pattern, something like that. And this got kind of big because it was a really useful way of extracting information in, in large data sets. Uh, it was widely used uh, later when Perl and Tickle, kind of the, uh, the scripting languages of the day in the 80s and the 90s, adopted regex as kind of part of their core language features. Today, the Perl syntax, the syntax that we use to write our regular expressions, is kind of the de facto standard because a lot of popular programming languages adopted exactly this kind of syntax. So when you look at how regular exp expressions are written in .NET, in C Sharp, for example, in PowerShell, uh, in Python, in Java, in Go, uh, they're all kind of derived from the original uh, Perl regex syntax. Uh, Larry Wall also commented on the fact that what we call regular expressions today are not technically regular expressions in kind of the language th 
theory um, uh, sense of the word. Uh, in a blog post in 2002, while discussing how to implement regex in Perl 6, a language which has still not been released as far as I know, uh, he said, what we call regular expressions are only marginally related to regular, uh, real regular expressions. Nevertheless, the term has grown with the capabilities of our, our pattern matching engines, so I'm not going to try to fight linguistic ne necessity here. We'll generally just call them regexes. So a regular expression is not really a regular expression, but we call them regular expressions because everyone else does. So there's a couple of different options built into the PowerShell language and the PowerShell API for using uh, regular expressions. Uh, some of you might have seen the select string commandlet. Uh, it wraps kind of the .NET uh, regex engine in a nice way, it gives you some added functionality and some nice parameters. Uh, you can pipe a string to it, input a pattern, uh, and, uh, and get some information about how that pattern matches onto the string you passed into it. The nice thing about the select string is that it also supports uh, file info objects, so you can do get child item to find a lot of text files and then just kind of munch them all through the pipelines to select string, and select string will come back and say, I found, I found that this pattern matches this string in this file. Very useful if you're ser searching like a large data set for a specific piece of information. There's also the match operator, which has been in there since PowerShell 2.0. Uh, it's a Boolean operator by default. That is, you have a, you have a string value on the left-hand side. Uh, you give it a pattern on the right-hand side, uh, and then it just tells you whether it matches or not. Like, does this pattern match onto, onto the string you provided? So the first example up here would, would return true, uh, because there's either a T or a W in stuff, it's not preceded by an A, and there's a U and one or more Fs after it. It's a little bit tricky, uh, but this is, this is literally how the regex engine works. The uh, match operator uh, is kind of coupled with, a, uh, with an autom automatical uh, variable called matches. So when you do a match operation, it'll stuff like the result of that into the matches variable, and you can go back and ins uh, inspect exactly the string that was actually matched on. So the matches, uh, the matches variable also supports something called named groups. So if you do a capture group, you say, this part of the pattern I want to kind of extract, you can give it a name. So here, the, the tough part of the, uh, of the word stuff, we've kind of grouped in a, um, in a name capture group called my group, and we can kind of index into matches and get exactly what was matched. So had I put in another word here, uh, have I, had I substituted the T for W, for example, it would have shown as woof instead of tough. Uh, the match operator also works as a filter operator. Uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with this, but every single scalar comparison operator in PowerShell also doubles as a filter operator. So instead of having one thing on the left-hand side, you give it a collection, and it will literally return to you every single, every single object that kind of matches the condition on the right-hand side. So this is a great way to filter. Instead of taking a bunch of strings, strings, piping them to where object, and then do your match operation in there, you can literally just apply the match operation if the collection that you have is just a string array. It's very nifty. Um, since PowerShell 2.0, you've also been able to use the regex type literal. It has a bunch of really useful static methods. Uh, this is the simplest. This maps directly back to the match operator. We're simply just testing again whether the input string matches this pattern on the right. This is the equivalent of splitting these two strings out and using the match operator. We're just calling the, the regex class directly instead. This is what the match operator does internally. Finally, in PowerShell v3, we got some new native commands that does some more interesting things that highly leverage uh, regular expressions. That is the split operator and the replace operator. The split operator uh, takes a, a pattern on the right-hand side, tries to match that onto the string, and then it uses that as the delimiter where it kind of splits your string. So in this case where we have a string containing a couple of words separated by commas and we do split by a comma, we're gonna get three strings back, two, many, and commas. Similarly, the replace operator takes two arguments, once again, uh, a, a regular expression pattern, and then a substitution. So the, uh, the escaped S, that means white space in, in these Perl-like uh, syntaxes, and so it's simply going to look for any one white space character and replace it with a comma. So doing the replace operation on the bottom, we're simply gonna end up with the string we originally split. 
Now, as I said, nobody wants to hear me babble on about this all day, so I think we're just going to jump into some code. Um, as I mentioned before, um, I spend most of my free time answering questions on the internet. And so what I did is I took a couple of examples of real world problems that people tried to solve and where they thought they might be able to you know, apply regular expressions. Uh, and then I'm going to kind of show kind of the proposed solution that I came up with to kind of solve this problem that they had. So a guy asked this question, I have a list of strings containing letters and numbers. I want to sort these first alphabetically and then kind of by the trailing number. So a string like containing AA would be sorted before AB, but these two strings, AB10 and AB9, I'd like the 9 to go first. Yes? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Is this better? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the sort object uh, commandlet and a lot of other uh, commandlets from the uh, utility module that ships with PowerShell, um, they have this default parameter called property uh, that allows you to specify property that you want to sort on or group on or whatever the commandlet does. And so you could supply a name, say length, for example, and we could sort on, this, uh, on the string length. The nice thing about these uh, sort object, group object especially, is that instead of a string, you can also supply a, uh, a script block. It will pass the current object in the pipeline into the script, script block as the dollar underscore variable, and then you can do some manipulation with it in there. So you can do, do some way more interesting stuff than just sorting on properties that are already exposed in the objects. So what we're going to do here is we're going to use the replace operator. This pattern right here, Escape D means digits, so any kind of digit, a one, a nine, a weird uh, numeral from the Korean language I haven't heard about, it'll take that and it'll replace it with nothing because I didn't supply a second argument. So what we end up with is that when I pass a string like A22 into the, uh, into the sort object, this replace operation will result in simply the string A. And so this way we can get sort object to first sort by anything that's not a digit, so sort alphabetically. And then as the second property, we're going to do the exact same thing, but reverse. The uppercase D means the opposite of digit, so anything that's not a digit, we're going to replace that. So we're going to remove anything that's not a digit, and we're going to end up with just the numbers that are left in the string. So if we try to run this, what we're going to see is that it correctly sorted all the ones that start with A comes first, then AA, and then AB. But we notice that something weird is going on here. Like 10 become, comes before 9. Uh, and up here, similarly, 111 comes before 22. What's that about? Any guesses? So it's being treated as a string. So when you sort alphabetically, any string that starts with the number 1 will be before any string that starts with the number two. So alphabetically, this is actually correct. 111 would come before 22 in the alphabet. But again, due to the power of being able to just supply the script block, we can literally do anything we want in here. I think uh, Tobias raised this point uh, in another comparison or another sorting scenario yesterday. Use the S operator. It's something called an unchecked cast. It'll try to take your input argument, turn it into the type on the right-hand side. If it fails, it'll, it'll simply return nothing. Otherwise, it'll return the actual integer that, that this expression was cast to. So if we try, try to do this now, ah, it actually orders them by the numerical value. Yes? Right, good question. So there's a, there's a distinct difference between doing S and then the type literal uh, uh, as opposed to doing int and then your expression after. So a normal cast, exactly what you're talking about, if that fails, if for some reason, if for some reason I pass in a value that cannot be passed as, a, as an integer, we're going we're gonna to get an exception thrown. So this is, simply to, this is simply just for me to avoid having a bunch of, you know, red squiggly text in the... Uh, um, in my console if for some reason there's no numbers in one of these strings, right? So that's kind of the defining difference between using S and using the more traditional uh, cast that also works in PowerShell V2. Uh, this is a V3 feature, by the way. 
Yes. Right. Okay. So the unchecked, uh, the unchecked uh, cast um, or conversion is culture sensitive, and the other one is culture insensitive. Okay. I don't think I have any examples where that matters. So let's keep over that. <laughs> All right. Um, so I proposed the solution, and the guy was. Great, now I can sort all of my strings, all right? Uh, another example I ran, on, uh, ran into recently was uh, from some sort of uh, system that outputted coordinates. Uh, let's say an integer, comma, another integer for a, a, an X and a Y axis. Uh, whoever exported the data, instead of using commas to delimit uh, the two coordinates, used a hyphen. And that works great if you have only non-negative integers. It doesn't work that well when you have negative integers. Because if I do 8 uh, hyphen 12 and I try to split that by a hyphen, I get the two values I expect, right? If I try to do the same thing with minus 4 minus minus 2, what I it splits my string into five different five different pieces, and now all of a sudden my integers are non-negative again. The regex engine has something called zero width assertions. Uh, anyone who went to Oyvind's talk uh, last year uh, might have gotten like a brief introduction to this, uh, but there weren't really any like tangible examples of where to use this. So this construct right here is known as a uh, positive look behind assertion. The idea is that whatever we define in here is not part of the text being matched. So if we use it in a replace pattern, for example, nothing in here is going to be replaced. But anything that's, that's in the pattern, so outside this weird construction, will only match if it's preceded by whatever we have in here. So this way I can split on hyphens only if they're preceded by an integer. So if we do this again, we're gonna see it's still gonna work for non-negative integers. But for negative integers, it works. Another question that came by, uh, came by recently was um, a guy who was trying to get some system information from uh, a bunch of servers, and he he couldn't rely on the uh, operating system version information in Active Directory, so he wanted to go out and poll each machine individually, and he wanted to get an idea of what operating system version he was running. He wanted to get a count of how many Windows 8, uh, Windows 7, and Windows 10 installations he had. And so what he tried was to extract this from the Win32 operating system WMI class. Now, the problem with this is that when you take the name property from this class, uh, I'm gonna show you right here, what you're gonna get is this weird pipe delimited string that has like the operating system product name, then it has like the system root, and the, the system boot position. We're not interested in, in that at all. Okay, so what can we do? Well, we could split it by this pipe to kind of get this information out into three pieces. So uh, let's try that. Oh, that's not really what I wanted. So as Tobias mentioned yesterday during his PowerShell quirks, Regex escapes, uh, uh, expects you to escape a number of meta characters. And one of these meta characters is the pipe symbol, because pipe means logical or in regex. Escaping is easy. You take the literal you have, and you just put a backslash in front of it, even if it's a backslash you're trying to match. So if we do this now, we're gonna get these three separate strings out. All right, now what do we do? Okay. Uh, we really only need the first part, so let's throw away the rest. Let's check. Oh, it's version name. Yep. Okay. But we're really only interested in the version. I don't care about the edition. If you're running Pro Home Preview, who cares? There's another regex for that. This pattern right here is simply going to match, again, a bunch of non-digit characters. So the white space and the characters that go into the name Microsoft Windows, then these parentheses, unescaped parentheses, around the next part of the pattern is called a capture group, an anonymous capture, capture group. And what it's going to do, it's going to capture all of the information that matches this part of the pattern. And then again, potentially, we have a number of non-digit characters again. Now, the interesting thing here is, what you're seeing is that I use something that looks like a variable, 
inside a, a, a non-expanding string. Uh, I don't know why they choose to do this in every other uh, implementation of uh, regular expressions in .NET. The escape sequence for a reference back to a capture group is backslash and then the number. For some reason, I don't know, they're, they just love the dollar sign, I guess. They chose this in your substitution. It gets really weird when you're trying to do back references inside the pattern because it's still, uh, it's still a slash and then the number. I don't know what's going on here, but what, what we're going to see here is that hopefully these digits that are in this string Microsoft Windows 10 Pro is going to be the only thing we're left over with. So let's try to do that. And it works. We get 10 back. An alternative to this, and this is where regex gets a little spicy for a lot of people, we could actually take all of these operations, finding the pipe, getting the first part of the, of the text out there, and then extract the number. We could con concatenate this in to one pattern. And in a single operation, we can also extract just the number that we need. Again, this is kind of a trade-off. How unreadable do you want to make your regex? Yes, Klaus. How about Windows 8.1? Good question. I haven't, I haven't had a need to solve that yet, but... Uh, oh. What you could do in here, that's a very good point. Uh, what you could do in here is you have one, or, you have one or more digits. You're going to have that no matter whether it's Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 8.1, or Windows 10, right? And so what you could do is you could do another non-capturing group inside your capturing group and say potentially there's going to be a dot and another digit in here and this way the capture group would take 10, 7, 8 but also 8.1. Yes? Right, so uh, I think what you're going to see in these kinds of operations is that it's negligible that you do like a bunch of nest, nested structures. It really depends on the input. And I think uh, you're probably gonna see when we go back to that Stack Overflow example from before, it's way more dependent on what you actually expect from your input than how advanced you're trying to do your, uh, um, your patterns. So in terms of trade-offs, it's not so much about performance, it's more about, can I read this in 10 minutes? Someone said yesterday that uh, regular expressions is a write-only language, and I have no illusion that anyone is going to go out here and say, oh, I can also read regular expressions now. It's just the way it is. All right. Another example that uh, Oivin kind of brought up last year, I think it was the very first example he brought up, was matching IPv4 addresses. Uh, and this gets really hairy really fast because it's really easy for humans to understand that each component in an IPv4 um, uh, representation is a number between 0 and 255, but try to express that in regular expressions. You're going to end up with these weird nested groups trying to validate that if there's more than three characters, we don't go over 255. And so this is probably pretty recognizable because anyone who has exposed themselves to this will have seen this horrible regex pattern, right? But it's really not very readable. So one of the things you could do is you could combine a simpler regex with some other type of validation, for example. So here we have a set of strings. Uh, if you look closely, there are two valid IP addresses in here and one that might look like a valid IP address but definitely isn't. So here we have a simpler pattern. This is almost readable. Uh, if you've exposed yourself a little bit to regex, it shouldn't take you more than a few minutes to at least decipher what's going on here. The idea is that we have um, between one and, and three digits and then a dot. This repeats three times, and then finally we have the last, the last octet of the IP, again, a digit, uh, two digits, or three digits. So if we define this pattern and we use the match operator, again, here we're using the match operator as a filter, input strings is a collection, right? It's a, it's a string array. So what we should expect is it's going to return anything that kind of matches that pattern. Okay, so let's have a look. Um, potential IPs. So it got all three of them, including the last one that isn't actually a valid, valid IP because we use this simple regex pattern that kind of catches a little broader. Uh, I think uh, Tobias also brought up uh, the idea of casting an IP address as a version. 
Uh, I'm not so sure about that. It seems a, a bit like abusing the version uh, type literal, especially because uh, PowerShell actually comes with uh, a type accelerator for the IP address class. So what we do here is we're simply going to munch all these IPs, these potential IPs that we found with our regex. We're going to again use the unchecked uh, cast operator to try to convert these to IP addresses. If that fails, we're not going to get any result or we're going to get an all back. We can filter that out with the where operator. And finally, we should have only the IPs that are actually valid. So if we do this, actual IPs, the one that wasn't a valid IP failed the cast to an IP address uh, class object and therefore didn't make it uh, through our expression. Does that make sense? All right. This one comes up all the time uh, in my professional life on the internet. Um, people have a bunch of folders. Uh, maybe they've migrated user profiles off from a different system. Maybe it's uh, remnants from some system that they're trying to upgrade. Um, and they want to rename them using some sort of pattern. So the question here, um, they had a bunch of folders that were literally migrated from one like user profile store to another. They had this weird format where, let me show you here. All the folders are named first name, last underscore last name. And then in parentheses is the user ID of the user. And to simplify a bunch of uh, scripts and, and automation and also anonymize some of this data. Yes? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's probably better. <laughs> Um, and so what they wanted to do is they wanted to simply extract the ID number, the digits that are inside, inside the parentheses, and then rename the folder to just that. Okay. So we can start by enumerating all the folders in the directory. Yeah, that was pretty easy to find. Then we filter on all the, uh, all the folders that actually match this name pattern that we're looking for. So here again, uh, this character class is known as the word character class. It includes, it includes uh, alphanumericals and underscores. And then finally, an escape parenthesis, um, a number of digits, which is the user ID we saw before, and then closing the parenthesis again. Uh, and again, what we're going to see is that, yes, it returns all of these folders that we want to rename. Finally, we pipe all of this to rename item. And again, by the magic of script blocks, Rename items uh, new name parameter takes also a script log as, as its argument. So instead of us having to pipe this to for each object, trying to validate that the string is what we need and extract, um, we can literally do it in line here. So here I'm referencing the file info object that I got piped to rename item. Uh, and the name of this is obviously going to be what you're seeing down here. So Wilbur Wagemann and then, uh, and then the ID. And what we're going to do here is again, we're going to replace this kind of expected pattern. But what I've added here, like before, I've added uh, an unescaped set of parentheses to kind of capture the, uh, the digits that make up the ID. And again, we replace the entire name with just those digits. Uh, I'm going to add what if to this because I don't want to rename them just yet. But what we're going to see is that, if we just look at the last operation here, uh, the, um, this folder right here sets a brisker and then the idea uh, is going to be renamed to just the ID, so exactly what we wanted. Very nice. This is just Thank you. Um, but what you can see I also did here in the replace pattern, I anchored, uh, I anchored the, the pattern that I'm looking for. Uh, this uh, meta character right here means start of string. And an unescaped uh, dollar sign means end of string. And so that means that I'm trying to match the entire name exactly. What this also means is that if I can't find this pattern in the name, the replace operation is going to fail because there's nothing to, to replace. So I can literally skip out this whole filtering step trying to make sure that I get the right folders and don't rename anything I don't want to rename because rename item is literally going to take any folder that doesn't mat match this pattern and just rename it to its own name. No big deal. So we can, just to show again, we have all these folders with the wrong, uh, the wrong kind of name. Let's remove this. 
Ta-da. All right. On to the next. Um, this was an interesting one. Uh, a guy, for some reason, I don't know why, maybe he was trying to generate names for some sort of system. Uh, he had an arbitrary string. He didn't know the length of the string up front. It might have been 20 characters. It might have been 40 characters. It might have been just one character. What he needed to do is he needed to append a random number at the end of this string. And again, he has no constraints on the range of random numbers that he's generating. So that could also result in a variable number of characters. And so he was like, okay, but by the end of this, if, if the resulting string is more than 20 characters, I need to cut it down to a maximum of 20 characters. And he knew that he could use the substring operator, the string operator, uh, to say, I want a substring from the zero, zeroth character. Uh, and then the minimum between his maximum of 20 or the length of the string. But how does he extract the length of this string that he didn't know because he just constructed it two seconds ago? Well, the obvious solution to this is that you need to do an assignment operation while you're working on this string. He needs to extract that string in order to be able to, um, to extract the, the length of the string plus the random number. Uh, this gets kind of ugly, and with all of these parentheses, it kind of looks like Lisp. Nobody wants to look at that. Um, so we can, okay, we can do it a little more terse, but now we're doing like four lines to just add a random number and, and do a substring operation. Maybe we can do it a bit more succinctly. What we're going to do down here is, again, we have an anchor, start of string, end of string. What we're going to be looking for is the dot, as Tobias showed yesterday, the dot matches any character in, uh, the dot is going to match any characters. And then this, uh, this quantifier here is going to tell us we want 20 times any character and then any number of more characters after that. And then we want to replace it with, again, this capture group here, the first 20 characters that we matched. Uh, and so what we end up with is a string that's at most 20 characters. And now you might say, well, what if the string was less than 20 characters in the first place? Same as the example above, the magic of this is that this anger regex is simply not going to match anything that is less than 20 characters because the very first requirements is that we can find 20 characters. So if it's not going to match, no replace is, go is going to take place. And so... Um, we can try and test this. Have our string of arbitrary length here. Um, let's just see. The resulting name is exactly 20 characters. Again, had we not appended the random number, um, so we had a, we had a string of, uh, of less than 20 characters, we can just remove this. This is a string of 16 characters, and we, we're going to do the replace operation again. Simply nothing happens to it, again, because the regular expression pattern did not match the string at all. Nothing to be done. All right. Um, so the other week, uh, I was preparing for a talk that I did yesterday with uh, uh, Eivind Karlstad, and um, I was looking at a way to kind of measure and profile my scripts line by line rather than using uh, measure command uh, to get like the, the full execution time. And so um, I knew of a project that had been written in C Sharp as part of the Windows SDK that could do this, but I wanted like a PowerShell solution. And uh, one of the guys in the, I think the PowerShell group on Facebook had posted uh, a part of this. So he literally taken the C sharp code, translated it to PowerShell, and I thought, oh, this is great. This is exactly what I need to use, right? So I took a look at his script. Um, it's very impressive, does some nice things. But the big problem I had with this was that you had these big type names all over the place, and it literally made the code super unreadable. If you go down here, you can see he needs to typecast a bunch of things. He needs to use uh, a bunch of constructors. And so I end up with all of this unnecessary repeated code. Uh, the nice thing about PowerShell, uh, uh, PowerShell v5 is that there's a new directive called using, where you can literally do using 
uh, using namespace. You take the .NET uh, type namespace that you want, let's say um, system management automation uh, language, and now I can literally remove the prefix from any of these type literals, and this is still going to resolve to the same kind of type. This is super nice, but <clears throat> this script is also 400 lines long, uh, and it had about, I think, 200 of these, and I didn't want to go through, through them manually. I also knew that I couldn't do like a bare, you know, uh, uh, search and replace because I might get into places where these namespaces were used outside type literals and I would, you know, mess up the entire script. So I thought about this a little bit um, and what I came up with is uh, this. Use regex. Here's a simple function that takes an input string, it could be the script we just looked at, uh, and uh, optionally a bunch of namespaces, these are just the ones I needed. Uh, and then what, what we have down here is uh, a regular expression pattern. Um, someone asked me yesterday, how are you writing readable regular expression patterns? As we saw before, they kind of fast get munched together and there's a lot of escape characters and it's not really very readable. Um, uh, one, uh, one way I've, I've dealt with this is to kind of spell it out a little, a little more visually. So what you're going to see here is I can kind of can kind of see, okay, this is kind of one group. Uh, here we have this logical or operator. So up here I kind of commented it out. And what you can see is, this is again one of, one of these uh, zero length assertions, uh, look behind. Uh, so I want only to match when something is preceded by either a comma, an opening or a close bracket, or um, a colon sign uh, followed optionally by Y space. Then I want to, this is just kind of a, um, a placeholder for the namespace that we're going to inject. And then what we do here is we capture the type name itself. So uh, a fully qualified type name in .NET uh, is the namespace dot and then your class name. So we're simply going to capture this so that we can reuse it and replace it later. And then finally, I want to make sure that every time we match, it's again either followed by a comma, um, and uh, an opening or a closed square bracket, or again, some optional white space at the end. And the reason for doing all of these weird look behinds and look aheads is that you might think that, you know, um, uh, you might think, okay, this is what a type literal looks like. You have these brackets, and then, you know, you have this fully qualified type name. But this is not the only way a type literal can look uh, in, um, uh, in, in PowerShell. So if you have something like an array, for example, uh, an integer array, all of a sudden you have these weird square brackets again. We also need to handle those. There are also uh, generic types. So you have something like a list um, where you need to specify which type of item you have inside your list. So you're going to have to do something like this. And it gets even trickier when you want to do something like uh, a custom dictionary. Um, again, generic dictionary, and I want uh, to use an integer as a key, a string as a value. Now I also have to handle this kind of comma here. So this is kind of why I need these uh, look ahead and, and look behind assertions around the type name. Now you might ask, isn't, isn't spacing all of this out going to mess up the pattern itself? Now you have a bunch of white space in there. Like, is that not going to match anything? Well, there's a solution for that, regex. So what we have here, uh, again, might look a little confusing, but we're literally looking for all the white space in my kind of template up here. I want to replace that, but I only want to replace it if it's preceded by an odd number of uh, backslashes. Because if there's an odd number of backslashes between my white space, it probably meant that whoever wrote the pattern had tried to uh, escape that white space. So if someone tries to, uh, this way you can still do like literal spaces in your pattern, then just escape them and we don't, we won't replace them. Again, I don't know if this makes it more readable. It makes the original pattern a little more explainable. Uh, but as someone said, you tried to solve a problem with regex. Now you have two problems. I tried to solve a regex problem with another regex. I'm not sure if I have four problems at this point. But let's see if it works. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna remove this again. Let's see, all looks good. Okay, so let's find this function. And then, as I said before, I'm just gonna remove this. What I'm going to do is, uh, I'm going to read um, 
I'm going to read this, this entire script, these 400 lines of code that I want to refactor into a single string. We can use get content uh, raw for that. And then I'm going to use my invoke uh, namespace refactoring function. The input string is the script that we just read. Input string. And I've already defined the namespaces that I want to replace, so let's see how that goes. It just outputs a bunch of text. I'm not going to scroll through it here. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to copy it to the clipboard. Super nice trick if you don't know this. Pipe to clip goes into your clipboard, doesn't work over remote sessions. If we now go back, what we should see is that all of our type literals are just the class name, right? And we have our using, using namespace uh, directives at the top. So instead of me going through all of this manually and rewriting all of this, you just saw it literally, well, it obviously took me some time to write all, uh, all of this regex bullshit out. But as you saw, it literally took me, you know, two, three seconds to replace the entire thing. And now I have a nice and readable script. Right, okay, so that's true. Uh, there's also an option in the .NET Regex engine for ignoring white space in the pattern. The reason I don't want to do that is because I don't really want to get into .NET Regex <laughs> engine options at this point because we could talk all day about that and, you know, someone would fall asleep. All right, um, there's one more cool thing that you can't really do with the built-in operators in PowerShell, the match and replace operators, but that you can do by invoking the, uh, uh, the Regex class itself. Someone asked this question, I have, I have these kind of structured space delimited strings. Um, one of the numbers in there has like a bunch of, uh, of leading zeros. I want to replace those with spaces. But I need them still to be, spa I, I need the same alignment as before. So what do you do about that? Okay, um, there's five zeros here. We're just gonna replace it with five spaces. Yeah, looks like it works. Now, what happens if there are only four leading spaces? Damn, it doesn't work anymore. The problem is that inside the substitution over here, we're not working with regex anymore. It's literally just expecting uh, a string that it'll just put in wherever it found a match. The way we can do this is by supplying something called a match evaluator to the regex replace uh, function. So here again, using the static replace uh, method, same operation again, we have our input string, we have the pattern that we want to replace, and then again, through the magic of script blocks, we can define a small little function in here. A match evaluator function uh, takes one argument, and that is the match info object, that, uh, the same kind of object that you get back from the matches property when you use select string. And the match object uh, contains a lot of nice things, including capture groups, name groups uh, that you defined in the pattern. But it obviously also contains the value that it matched on. So in our case, it's going to contain the five zeros in the first example and four zeros in the second example. We can kind of abuse this to say, oh, I just want one space for every single character that you matched on. So let's see how that works out. Now they're all of a sudden aligned again. This is really useful, again, if you're doing substitution patterns that heavily depend on what you actually matched uh, in, the, in the string. Um, the replace operator sim simply isn't going to cut it. Um, I think we're just gonna skip over this one. It's not that interesting. Um, this one was more interesting. Someone, uh, someone asked a question, um, I have a string and I want to test if any of, you know, a number of strings are contained in there. So the example, the example I used here is this string contains word two, but none of the others. And what we're going to do here is we're going to look for word boundary. We have a non-capturing group that's again using the or operator. So whatever we match on has to be either word one, word two, or word three. Since word two is in the string, all right, now it gets a little trickier. How can I test if, if the input contains all of the strings? 
So I give you an input string and I want to know if it contains word one and word two and word three. Okay, uh, start with the word, word boundaries again. We're gonna do uh, the first word, then um, optionally some more characters. The second word, number of characters. Uh, the third word and the word boundary again. Um, this time the input string contains word one, word two, word three. Okay, great job. But what if I wanna know if these strings exist as substrings, but in any given order? What if I wanna know that a string like this, it contains all three words that we're looking for, but not in the order that we're expecting them. And there's no way for us to kind of, you know, anticipate what order these words are going to come up in our input string. Gonna try kind of the same strategy again. False, damn. As I said before, we have these nice things called uh, zero width assertions. And we can abuse those a little bit. Just gonna copy this pattern down here because it's a little un unreadable. But what the regex engine is going to do is, it's literally going to jump over here and said, okay, I'm gonna have to look for zero or more of any characters, but they need to have been preceded by word three and optionally some other characters. They also need to have be preceded by word, word two and some other optional characters. And finally, they also have to have been um, uh, preceded by word one and some optional characters. And this way, we can actually assert that all three strings are present in the input string without knowing the order of hand. Now, this is where the question you asked before uh, becomes a little interesting because this is starting to cost a bit of CPU cycles because every time it needs to go back and check was whatever I found in this string preceded and, uh, by all of these three, uh, three patterns, right? With three words, you're probably gonna be okay. If you start to do this with a thousand words, you might have problems. Okay, so I tried to write this one out as well. Again, we have a, a positive look ahead assertion trying to make sure that the word is in there somewhere. We do that for all three words. Um, but so I was interested in trying to kind of abstract this away. This is useful for this one case where this one guy is using word one, word two, word three, but it's not very interesting tomorrow when another guy's gonna come in and say, I have these five different words that I wanna test again. So let's see if we can turn this into a more useful tool. So I defined this uh, simple function called match any order. Again, we take an input string and we take a number of strings that we want to find as substrings in there. Uh, if we go back and look, kind of look at the actual pattern here, I'm just gonna copy it down here again. What we're gonna see is that all of this is variable, right? This is depending on the number of search terms we have and it's depending on the input itself. So if we kind of wrap that out, and just do a placeholder here, we end up with a pattern like this. The pattern for each search term is itself something like this. Our positive look at uh, definition, any number of characters, our word boundaries, and then the word itself. Again, back to what Tobias said yesterday, in order to not kind of shoot yourself in the foot by uh, um, by giving some input that might have a bunch of meta characters that are gonna trip up uh, your patterns. You could just have the regex engine do the escape for you. You pass your string literal, it's gonna escape it correctly for you if there are, there are any, any meta characters in there. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take these strings, it could be word one, word two, word three, gonna run them through for each, place them back into our, our template up here, but in an escape form, join them together, finally put them into our pattern. And when I run this, just gonna use a write host, don't do this at home, uh, to, to kind of write out the pattern that it constructs. So if we define this function, and let's use this example again. Match any order. And then again, we input our terms, could be in any order. Let's do them in reverse, word three, word one, word two. Again, we get, a, we get the right result back. Uh, as you can see here, it's, just going, to, uh, it's go just going to shuffle them in there in whatever order we supplied it, but to the regex engine, that doesn't matter because they have to be true anyways. We could also do this with anything else. We could say, um, uh, I love PowerShell, super duper. And then we're gonna say match 
any order with the terms uh, duper, PowerShell, and I. It returns true again. If we replace this with Perl, ooh, nope. All right. All right. So the first the first example I came up with, he was literally asking. What if I want to just test for any character? And I said, well, okay, if we kind of take a step more back, we could probably abstract this into a function that could do both. So based on whether you're asking for any or all matches, we'll just construct our pattern inside a function. And then instead of me doing, you know, using the match operator, I want to give you the nice value of all the nice bells and whistles that the select string uh, commandlet gives you. So what you're going to see here, it may look a little convoluted, but I didn't write this. I generated all of this. Has anyone here heard about uh, what's called wrapper functions or proxy commands? Yeah? Familiar with proxy commands? Okay, super, uh, super fast intro to proxy commands. Um, the idea is that, um, say get command, select, st select string. We're going to store this in a variable. This is going to give us back something called a... Uh, uh, a command info object or a commandlet info object that carries meta metadata about the implementing type for this for this commandlet. What we can do then is we can say simply meta um, we can generate this kind of command metadata structure from our command info object. So we're just gonna pass the command in object in there. Now we have this CMD meta object has a bunch of information about how this how this command um, uh, behaves, what kind of parameters it exposes, and so on. Now comes the magic. System.management.automation.proxy command. If you look at these functions here, you're going to see that it has a bunch of really interesting uh, static methods like get commandlet binding attribute, get help comments, get param block. So what this is going to do when we pass our command metadata object into it is it's literally going to e extract all of these things as if you were to re-implement re them. So if I do create and pass in our command meta object, it's going to spew out a bunch of text. I'm not going to scroll through it. I'm just going to use clip again. And the result I, I gave back, as you can see here, is a proxy function that has all the same input parameters as the original command that I used, select string. And then in the body down here, you're going to see that it's going to do, it's going to wrap, oh, wrap the original command in something called a command wrapper. And this gives me the opportunity to kind of modify what I want to do with the command before it gets invoked. Right now, it's just kind of, it's just a proxy around, right? So what I did was, uh, see here, what I did is I just filled in the code from the other function we had before. We're going to escape all of the all of the terms so that we don't trip up the regex engine. I added two parameters, uh, two parameters switches, one called any, one called all. If the user chooses the uh, the any parameter set, we're going to do the same pattern, the same simple pattern that we uh, that we showed first, where we just search for any of these strings. Otherwise, we're going to do the exact same thing again. We're going to generate these clauses where we we do these zero width assertions, one for each word, and then finally bake it into a pattern, exactly the same procedure as, as in the match any order. Finally, we're just going to remove a bunch of parameters from PSBound parameters to not trip up a select string. Um, and so what we're going to end up with here, if I define this, Select match. Um, we're just going to do PowerShell Perl C sharp and choose the any switch. Oh, wrong parameter name. Nope, 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 nope. What did I call this? Go again. Substring, substring, yeah. So, and 
that. That was interesting. Yeah, I find it. Well, nothing like a broken demo. Sorry about that. All right. Um, finally, I have one more thing I want to talk and talk about. Uh, the very first slide I showed with the uh, Audish post from uh, the Stack Exchange Network, uh, as they said, it was kind of a, a, a regular expression that they maybe hadn't um, uh, did too, done too much quality assurance on, and it literally caused their entire infrastructure to crash. And so. The interesting thing is, uh, if you read the blog post, I'll gladly link, it, link to it after, what they did was they literally had this seemingly super simple and innocent regular expression pattern here. What this is going to do is it's simply going to look for, at the start of the string, are there any white space characters and then some Unicode character I don't know about. If there's, um, if there's one or more of those, trim them, this is a replace operation. And do the same thing again, if you find any white space characters, or this character, if you find any of them uh, before the end of the string, trim them again. Um, so I, I read the, uh, the post-mortem and I thought that's interesting because I don't think I would have used regex for this actually. Um, I think I would have used the trim command. Uh, I think Tobias showed this yesterday again. It can be a little, it can be a little tricky if you don't know how it works. But trim is super simply, super simple. It's simply going to uh, go from the start and the end of the, the string and try to find any of the characters you supply to it and remove. So what I did here, I tried, to, I tried to do a version of this in PowerShell. Uh, what this code does is, it's literally going to. Uh, read, um, read a file that consists of a little bit of white space, a string, 20,000 pieces of, white, uh, of uh, white space, and then another character before the actual end of the string. What this is going to cause the, the, the .NET Regex engine to do is it's going to inspect each and every one of these 20,000 20, space characters all the way to the end, only to realize that there's, oh, there's another character before the end of the string. I better back up and try again. So now it's going to do it for the 19,999 characters that precede this last non-space character. And it's going to do that again until it comes to the end of it. And I think they made a calculation. Every time anyone viewed the front page on Stack Overflow, this regex back backtracking was happening 200 million times. And this is literally what brought their site down. It also didn't help that the question made it to the front page and anyone logging in literally caused, you know, 200 million validations to occur. But so what I did here is uh, I tried to do this in PowerShell, implement this in PowerShell, read in this terrible string that they didn't expect, um, do the regular expression that they did, and then do the equivalent with trim. I tried to do this in PowerShell last night. I had to uh, kill the process after 30 minutes and my CPU getting a little too hot. So I'm not going to do it in PowerShell today. I compiled a small, um, a small program in C Sharp that's going to do the exact same thing. Um, fortunately, there, there's no uh, syntax highlighting here. But what, what you can see here is we're, we're literally going to do the regex replace operation. The input string is, uh, is, is the file in question. And then this pattern that I, that I described before. Down at the end here, I've simply made a char array with every, every single Unicode character that the white space character class matches, plus this weird uh, U200C. And then instead of the replace operator, I'm just going to do a string trim. And so let's see which one kind of fares, fares best here. Um, I think I already compiled this, so we're just going to do um, stack over fail. It's going to run for a little while. All right, using regex, this took seven and a half seconds to trim just a few pieces of white space of one single string. Using the string tri trim operation, we're not even getting up to a single millisecond. This literally took, what is that, about eight microseconds. 
So they're definitely, again, depending on how much control you have over the input string and how much you can you know, expect of, of their conformity, there's definitely uh, cases where you might want to go back and say, okay, let's just do some simple string operations um, rather than use regex all over the place. Um, that was it for me. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to take them. Yeah. Yes, I'll post this on, on GitHub uh, when we're done here.